All right, so it's one after. So let's get this thing, uh, let's get this going. So maximizing composer. I'm sorry, <laughs> I will get you to your beer. Well, actually, there's nothing really stopping you, Mike. So don't let me stop you. Uh, maximizing composer. So for the past year, I have been giving another presentation that some of you may have seen, um, taking maximum advantage of composer. And now this is maximizing composer. So it's completely different. Um, I actually left a lot of the beginner stuff behind. And we're going to focus more on the solid intermediate stuff, more on plugin stuff, a uh, couple of um, uh, examples that we'll do live because, you know, why not? And then we'll talk about Composer 2 and how freaking awesome it is um, just from a speed and memory usage standpoint. That's really, you know, if you're really tired and you don't hear anything else I say, start playing with Composer 2 because it uses a lot less memory and it's a heck of a lot faster. That's really all you need to know about maximizing Composer is just use version two. But we'll get there. I'm gonna, that's the tease because those are like literally my, like my last few slides. So here we go. Let's uh, click that, click that. Okay, so if you would like to have a copy of these slides, there you go bit.ly slash max composer two. And I will, oops, I was here. I'll put these right in the chat right now. Bit, oh, I can't type. Dot L Y slash max composer two. There you go. If you want the slides, grab them from there, please. All right. So what is the plan for today? Let's talk about the plan. Um, we're going to talk about some version constraints. I'm not going to go too deep but I am going to talk about a, a few things that um, if you don't know them yet, you should know them. And if you think you know them and then you see what I have to say, and then you're sure that you know them, then I'm, then, you know, then you have a little bit more confidence, which I think is what a lot of composer stuff is it's just gaining confidence. Uh, we're going to talk about some plugins. We'll do a couple of plugin examples, a couple of my favorites and a couple of examples that I use just about on every site. Um, conflict resolution, dependency conflict resolution. So what happens, this is basically the, uh-oh, well, something went wrong, what do I do section. And I'm gonna give you some tips. I'm gonna give you the stuff that works for me the vast majority of the time. Um, maybe not all the time, but um, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go. We're gonna dive just a little bit into the composer.lock file. Um, and I cover this, um, I've been talking about this for a good four or five, six months um, now uh, in, in the various composer classes that I teach. Thank you, Luke, for making it clickable. Much appreciated. Um, but we're going to talk about Composer Lock File. Then we'll talk about Composer 2 versus Composer 1, and then we'll be done. And then uh, Mike can go have it. Mike, I'm not I'm talking about not me in the third person. I'm talking about uh, Michael K in the first person. He, no, I guess I'd be the second person. You can go have a beer. And if you scroll back in the chat, you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, so version constraints. Uh, caret versus tilde. Now, I don't know about you, but when I, not even when I first started using Composer, let's say solidly for the first two years of me using Composer, I was too lazy to really dig into like, what's the difference? And I was just kind of confused a little bit and I would it'd be a little bit of trial and error on which of these I should use and what each of them means until I, finally decided I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna start teaching this. So I better like come up with a, with a good uh, definition. And basically this is it. It's actually really easy. The uh, caret locks the major version. It locks the first digit of the version. And the tilde allows the last digit specified to float. And by flow, it's really increase is what we mean. So what does that mean? If you do a tilde, 2.0, I'm sorry, like a caret 2.0. That's basically saying you're willing to accept everything greater than or equal than 2.0.0 and less than 3.0.0. So it locks the two, but the dot O and the second dot O are allowed. Um, the asterisk is, uh, you know, 8.8.asterisk dot .8 dot is the same as uh, tilde 8.8.0. .8 it's a wild card. 
And Sean, I don't know if you're just messing with me with that question or not. So I answered it like, like you were serious. So um, carrot 2.0.0 is equivalent to the same thing. So it doesn't matter with carrots. It doesn't matter if you specify that third digit or not. Um, it basically is just going to lock that first digit in. The tilde, tilde 2.0 is equivalent to carrot 2.0, which is equivalent to everything more than 2.0.0 and less than 3.0.0. But as soon as you specify that second dot zero in 2.0.0, now you're limiting yourself to things greater than 2.0.0. And actually that should be greater than or equal. There's a typo right there. There should be a little equal sign right there. Greater than or equal 2.0.0 and less than 2.1. So, in this case, it's just locking that last zero. Uh, preferred method? No, not really. I mean, if you need to, if you're working with a dependency and you know that the next minor version, you know, introduces a change you don't want, then use, you know, tilde 2.0.0. And that'll, that'll lock down the second digit as well as the first digit and allow that third digit to increase. Um, otherwise, I mean, Composer uses caret by default. When you say composer require vendor slash name, um, inside of your composer.json, you'll, you know, if, as long as it has a stable release, inside of your composer.json, composer will put caret major version dot zero. Um, so I don't think there's a preferred mes uh, method. Um, there's the default method, I would say. Um, but I tend to use both depending on, on, on what I need. Uh, a couple other things, pre-release versions. Um, if you throw an at beta after it, then not only will you get everything, in this case, greater than or equal to one and less than two, but if there are more recent, if there's a beta or an RC version that's more recent than the latest stable, you'll get that instead. So that basically allows you to get ahead of stable. Um, if you want a specific beta version, this is the syntax. So notice there's no wiggle room here, meaning there's no caret, there's no tilde. But if you know that like beta three broke something that, but beta two has something you want without something broken or whatever, you can ask for a specific beta with this type of uh, syntax. Um, and then the dash dev is the one that, that, that is tricky, especially if you're committing dependencies to your repo. Um, dash dev is going to get you exactly what you're asking for the dev version and being in the Drupal community, we're used to, you know, seeing dev versions and, you know, these are things before that a beta or a, or a stable release gets tagged. Um, but when you do request a dev, you're, it's going to be cloned as opposed to downloaded. Most of the time, Composer is just going to download a gzip and extract it, stick it in your vendor directory, stick it in your modules contrib directory and off you go. But as soon as you, you slap a dash dev on there and you start clone and you, you know, and you're asking for a dev version, uh, Composer is going to clone that down to your local um, or into whatever environment you're working in. So if you are committing dependencies to the repo, then now you've got a repo in a repo. And now you've got a Git submodule situation. Um, so there's a few ways to handle that. Um, you know, the bottom line is you generally have to get rid of the dot Git um, a directory inside of that uh, dependency. And you can even get super specific. You know, you can actually tell Composer that you want a specific commit from a specific branch. And that will clone. Um, I just stumbled upon this one day while I was, you know, in my leisure time reading the getcomposer.org documentation, as I'm sure all of us do in our, in our free time. Um, but I stumbled upon this and I said, oh, that's really cool. I, I, I haven't needed it yet, but it's there if, you know, if you need something super specific, um, it's there. So this tool, uh, it's a cool tool. If you are still like a little bit on the fence about understanding version constraints, try out this tool. So um, let's go and let's say we want to check out some versions of Twig. So I'm, and I know that I did not create the site, so the I know the contrast is horrible. So just you know, don't yell at me. You can take out your anger on someone else for that. Um, but you can say, okay, well, what if I if my version constraint is just one dot o dot star, and I'm sticking with stable releases, um, 
you know, no, I guess there are no 1.0. Yeah, there's, yeah, the first release was a 1.3. So here, let's do the 1.8. Star. 1.8. Star as a version constraint allows you to access to those four. But what happens if we do, let's say, a tilde 1.8.0? Same things. What happens if we just do a tilde 1.8? We get rid of the dot zero. Now the dot eight is allowed to float, or the eight, the, the, the minor version is allowed to float. So we get everything from 1.8 all the way up to 1.43 because this thing is allowed to float. Um, and what happens if we change that to a caret? Well, in this case, nothing. Oops, especially if we put both of them in. That's a you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, let's say we allow our minimum stability for our project allows release candidates, and we get this one filled in as well. So this is a really cool tool to just kind of mess around and um, visually see what these version constraints um, are doing. So definitely check that out if you're a nerd about this stuff, like I am. All right, here's a little quiz. So a pop quiz for everybody. Um, oh, okay, well, I don't, I don't give you the answer here, but are, are these two things always equivalent? If you compose, if you do a composer require on vendor name one, and then a composer require on vendor name two, is that always the exact same thing as doing composer require vendor name one, vendor name two at the same time? Just the fact that I'm asking it and the way I'm asking it should give you an idea of what the answer is. Anybody want to uh, go out on a very stable branch? That's a git pun, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, the answer is no. Um, so consider the case where you have a dependency that requires another dependency, but the 3.x branch. And then you've got a second dependency that requires an earlier version of that same name three. I know my naming is horrible. I should have named these after like, you know, hair products or something, um, but I didn't, so. Oh, geez, sorry. <laughs> so think about it. If you do a composer require vendor name one hit enter, you're going to end up with version three dot something of the name three dependency. And then in your second step, if you go and try and do composer require vendor name two, you're going to get denied because you already have version three of name three. Yeah, these names are really terrible. I'm going to change this tonight. I'm sorry. Um, but name two requires version two of name three. Um, so really the solution, if you've already gone that far is to basically, if you can, if you can see what's going on, you'll have to actually remove vendor slash name one and either reverse the order, you know, do a composer require on name two before name one or sorry, or require them at the same time. Composer require vendor name one space vendor name two and let composer figure out which version of name three is um, is, is needed. So just be, be careful and think about this stuff. Um, and we're going to talk about like what happens when you get into situations like this, like what's the best way to solve them in, in a few minutes. Now let's talk about plugins though, because for me, um, like if you're a beginner composer user, I think you're doing a lot of stuff just by memorization. Like, you know that I need to add something, so I have to type these things in, on my keyboard and hopefully it'll happen. And if it doesn't, I'm screwed. Um, but once you get comfortable with that, really composer plugins, I think are the next step. Like I feel for me, at least, once I really got familiar with plugins, then I felt like, okay, I was a solid intermediate with composer, with, with the tool itself. Um, yeah, Miles, no, no. We're not going to have that kind of talk here, Miles. Miles France. It sounds like a, um, like a, uh, like a spy name, uh, like a super spy type of thing. Anyway, so composer plugins. I think once you get comfortable with these, and even once you start seeking out more plugins like that aren't Drupal related, I think that's when you really become like a composer intermediate user. So if you're using, you know, uh, the new template that you know, came uh, out with Drupal 8.8, the, the Drupal recommended project, um, you're using Composer plugins. There's actually three of them in there. Um, you got Composer installers, which allows Drupal modules to live in the modules contrib directory as opposed to the vendor directory. Um, 
Drupal core composer scaffold, which takes files like your index.php and your HT access file and moves them out of the core folder into like your, your web root where they belong. Um, and by the way, we'll do a demo of that later. It let, lets you mess with your scaffolding files on the way. Um, oh, this is actually not true. This here, I'm lying already. So um, composer patches is not included. Well, wow, three, this, this is what happens. The first time I give a presentation, I find all the bugs, not while I'm preparing, but while I'm actually giving it. Um, composer patches is not part of the recommended project template, but um, you know, a lot of folks use it. So we're going to talk about that. But this allows you to apply patches to any dependency just by adding some, you know, some information to your composer.json. It really makes patching easy and approachable. Um, yeah. So I actually wrote a blog post a few months back about composer plugins. Here's a short URL, a shortish URL for it. Um, and I broke it up into sections like here's some must haves, here's some ones worth considering. And I really only have one in the section of don't consider it. And I feel every time I mention it, I feel guilty because it's the core um, uh, core project message one. It actually, it's part of Drupal core and it's a little plugin that whenever you do a composer create project on Drupal recommended project, it, project, it gives you a nice welcome message. And it's very nice and it's very happy and, and warm, but once you th see that message, get that get that thing out of there, get that dependency out of there. All right, so let's do an example. Um, I actually have two. I actually have two examples set up. So core composer scaffold. Um, so I don't know if uh, many of you are aware, but starting with Drupal 8.8, .8, um, all of those scaffolding files, all of the core files that don't live in the core directory, actually are included in the core directory. Um, so if we come over here, I've got a Drupal 9 instance. And if we just do a real quick ls-al web slash core slash, you know, you'll see an assets folder and look, it's got a scaffolding, a scaffold, and then it's got a files. Look at that. Here are all of the scaffold files and they're kind of buried inside here. So here's like the Drupal index.php. And, you know, this doesn't, you know, this isn't going to do much living in here. It really needs index.php needs to live in your doc root out here. So what does the scaffolding plugin do? It basically runs after, you know, basically composer install-ish commands. So, you know, create project, require, remove, update, commands like that. And it basically copies scaffolding files from deep down in core to their proper place in your project. So this is a heck of a lot more efficient than the old scaffolding plugin. This is pre Drupal 8.8 .8 days, this is the Drupal composer, Drupal project days. Um, that scaffolding plugin was basically just a script that downloaded all these files from drupal.org every single time that you like ran a composer command. And that was super inefficient. Um, so this is a lot more efficient and it's a lot more flexible because you can like get involved in the process. So um, da, 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 da. so this is the readme file. This is the main readme file. And if I just do a quick web, um, oh, geez, I already got rid of it. So uh, hang on a second. Ah, boy, 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 boy. Pico composer.json. Let me, I probably just did this demo and forgot to, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. Look at that, I already did the demo. I need a time machine right here. Let me, do, 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 don't, nothing to see here. Composer install. Ignore what I'm doing here. There we go. Okay. And look at this. It's like, it's like it never happened once I do that. So like, there's the readme file, the Drupal core readme file that we all know and love. And, you know, really, do we need this? Like, does this need to be part of your repo? Or does this need to be, you know, on your, you know, production environment? No. You know, probably install.txt doesn't either. Um, so there's some low hanging fruit here. Files, you know, scaffolding files that we don't need. They're they're helpful, you know, I guess when you're first starting get, getting started with Drupal, but you really don't need them. Um, and, you know, some can consider these a security uh, um, issue because they make it real easy for um, someone, you know, trolling the, the internet to figure out, you know, that you're using Drupal. Um, so... Let's get rid of them. 
So, I mean, obviously we're going to, you know, we'll do both of them. So let's just, you know, we're going to just, uh, oops, let's just RM them first of all, right? So let's just get rid of that and RM install. Okay, that's all great. And yeah, sure, they're gone. But, you know, the next time you do a composer install, um, guess what? That core composer plugin is basically just going to say, okay, I'm going to recopy them. And poof, they're back. So let's let's get rid of them for good, shall we? So how do we do that? Well, we have to basically configure the core composer scaffolding plugin to, we have to tell it, we don't want them back. Um, so let's get rid of them again. No, so, so they're gone now. And let's come over here to, and I'll just grab doo -doo -doo -doo, this little code. This is actually the stuff. Hold on, let me come over here where I can copy and paste stuff easier. Let me copy that, come back over here. And what do you do? So you edit your composer.json file. And then you come down to your extra section. And the extra section of your composer.json is really all of the settings for your plugins. So the scaffolding plugin is looking for its settings in something called Drupal Scaffold. So you can come here and I'm gonna put a comma there and I'm gonna paste that and I'm gonna paste it again. Well, actually, no, I don't need to paste it again. That's silly. So let's just uh, doot, 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 get rid of those. And so it's gonna be, we're gonna change the file mapping. And what are we gonna do? Basically, it's a, it's a to from scenario. So the to is on TO, not number two. TO is on the left side of the colon. So copy to here. And what do we wanna copy from nothing? So in other words, don't copy anything to this. In other words, don't create that. And that's really all there is to it. Um, so let's actually do that twice for the install file as well. Web root install.txt false. And I think that all looks good. Someone yell at me if you see something. Um, I love, let me do this just to, I love Composer Validate. This basically tells me if I have a, you know, a, a missing comma or something. And uh, it looks good. And we're going to talk about this red lock file stuff in a minute. Um, so our Composer uh, uh, .json is valid. Now, if you do a Composer install, um, we're skipping. Look, we're skipping because it's overridden. It's skipped. Yay. No more install and readme file. So easy to do. You know, if you're not going to use a little built-in PHP um, uh, uh, web server, I think this is like the configuration for that. Get rid of that as well. You know, I'm all about keeping things as lean as possible. So if you don't need, you know, some of these scaffolding files, then ASIM is what I say. Um, so I got another little quick example here, and you may have seen it come through. Um, it's one I've already put in there, but I'll show it to you anyway. So I actually have, let me command K. Okay, There's another scaffolding thing. I created an assets directory on my project root. And in there, I basically have a patch. So I basically created a patch for my HT access file because I want some special stuff in there in the HT access file. Um, I don't want to delete the HT access file. I just want to patch the one that, that Drupal core gives me. So this is just a regular old patch, um, you know, I mean, I can show it to you. It's not anything big. It's basically getting rid of this stuff. Um, and again, we can, you know, uh, sorry, we can pico our composer.json. And this is not in the extra section. This one works a little bit differently. You have to go down and actually have a little script. There's actually a, it's like a Drupal hook, right? Post Drupal scaffold command. So this is like, hook Drupal scaffold or hook after Drupal scaffold if we want to, you know, translate this into Drupalese. So here's a script that's going to run after the Drupal scaffolding plugin runs every time. And what's the script? Well, we go to the web directory and we apply the patch. Boom. HT access is pat patched. So basically what this is, is next time there's an update to Drupal core, if you have special modifications to your .htaccess file, you don't have to do anything. 
you can just, you know, let this run. And as long as the patch applies cleanly, you're good to go. You know, obviously there's always a chance that core is going to change the HT access file and then your patch may not apply cleanly, but that's definitely not going to be every time. Um, so you can also append. Um, so I use uh, the appending and, and appending you can do up here in extra. Um, so you can actually append as well. So that's good for like uh, robots.txt if you need to append to the, to the end of that. So a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with your um, uh, scaffolding uh with the core scaffolding tool so definitely use that because it's a good one composer patches I, you know once i saw this and started using this i don't know how anybody like manages a drupal 8 site without this um because it's pretty rare these days not to have any patches on you know core or contrib um i'm not saying you know everyone has a patch on core but most sites of sig you know anything but the kind of a smaller site, um, most sites are gonna have at least one or two patches maybe in the contrib space. Um, and this just makes it dead, drop dead easy to, 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 to do. Um, so basically you require it. Um, C. Wiegans, Cameron uh, Egans is actually, a, um, he's been a long time Drupal community member, but he created this as well. Um, well, actually he, he forked another uh, dependency to come up with this, which, you know, I think a lot of folks are using now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to patch draggable views and I got to go here again. I'm sorry. Let's see. So let's just pretend that doo, 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 we come over here. We go to drupal.org slash node slash this, you know, we're using draggable views and everything's great, but oh my gosh, it doesn't work with the group by feature in views and I need it to. And it's not committed yet. It's just a patch out there. So let's say we want to apply this patch and I forget which one we use. And now I probably have it right here, patch number 40. So we're going to patch it with, uh, yeah, uh, this patch right here, the latest patch. So we come here and, you know, blah, 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 patch, patch, patch. Here's the URL. Well, first thing we need to do is we probably, probably a good idea if we had draggable views. Those are required Drupal slash draggable views. So this just shows you pretty how fast Composer 2 is. It's it's pretty darn fast. Do, 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 and it's done. That's lovely. And look, we still don't have, uh, you know, installer readme. So now that we have that, so let's come over and we're going to get this syntax. And the syntax is pretty easy, but I'll walk you through it because that's kind of what presentations are all about, right? Eco Composer dot Jason. And we're gonna again come down to the extra section. So I'll put it right at the top of the extra section so it's so it's obvious. Oh, why did Siri? Siri just did I say something that was close to Siri a second ago? Ralph, I see your question. I will uh, answer it in a second. And we're gonna paste. And do, 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 and let me just get all of this all nice and pretty. Uh, Oh, actually, no, I want to do it this way. A uh, lot of indentation here. One, two, three, four. Boom. Line that up. One, two, three, four. Okay. And then one more thing we got to do. Let's just get this. Boom. Okay. One, two, three, four. Hopefully. Hopefully I didn't mess anything up too bad there. All right, so Composer Patches basically looks for um, extra settings in using the patches key. And then you provide the vendor and name of the dependency. So Drupal Draggable Views is the dependency that needs to be patched. And then it's an array. Um, and then each one, um, each line basically has a description. So I tend to use the, you know, the same as the title of the issue, right? Not working with group by feature, not working with group by feature. And then it's literally just, this is just the path to that patch. So, I mean, you know, I, you basically come here and like, oh, I want to use this patch. Copy this, paste it there, and you're done. All right, so let's X out of that and save. Let's do a composer validate to make sure we're good. 
da, 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 we're valid and let's just do a composer install and da, 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 and let's see do not da, da, let's see nothing to install um, did not see it run there hmm. uh composer why did not it not run there did i miss it let's see no no Raw file no no Patching file. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, do I have composer patches installed on this? Eco composer patches. That could be the whole problem. Oh, look, I don't have composer patches. So it would be a good idea if we actually had the dependency. <laughs> I skipped a very important step there. Composer require cwegans slash composer patches. Let's get that. There we go. And da, 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 package, we got that. We got that extracting. OK, so now let's try if I do a composer install. There we go. OK. So it saw that there are patches. So it basically reinstalls draggable views and then it applies the patch and that's it. So if for some reason the patch didn't apply anymore, there'd be a little message saying, Hey, the patch doesn't apply anymore. At which point you've got to do the normal things you have to do. You come and you come over here and you see if maybe your patch got committed. Um, in which case you can remove it from composer patches. You see if maybe there's a new version of, of, of draggable views and the patch, patch need to be needs to be re-rolled, or maybe there's a more up-to-date patch. These are all normal Drupal things you would have to do. Um, but I mean, it's it, it's dead simple, and it really takes a lot of the fear out of um, applying patches. If you have a patch that's specific to your site, which probably isn't the best thing, but you know we all have to do it every now and then. This path does not have to be a remote. You can basically have a local patch, you know, pull it out of your, you know, patches directory on, in your project group. Um, so there's, a, there's actually a lot of different ways that you can configure composer patches, but this is the, by far the one I see used the most often. All right, so Ralph has a question. Is composer patches necessary at all as soon as Drupal issue forks is available? From that point on, could you use the branch and commit locking you presented before? Um, sure. Yep, I guess if you want, Ralph, you can um, you can do it that way. Um, I don't know if I would have a preference. I'm, I'm trying to, I, no one's asked me that question before. Um, so for me, Ralph, I think I would stick to the way I'm doing it right now because the way I'm doing it right now, basically you start off with something stable and then you're applying one patch. So you're limiting the number of variables just to that one patch. If you are checking out a different branch that just happens to have the stuff you need, you might also be getting other stuff that isn't fully vetted yet, if that makes sense. So that's like my thinking about it for 30 seconds answer. I think I would probably still stick with this way just because I'm, my mentality is like limit the number of variables. You know, you saw it when I was talking about the um, uh, the um, scaffolding plugin, right? Just limit the variables, get rid of the, the files we don't need. So, all right, let's move on, shall we? Um, so those are two good ones. Um, run composer install. Dependency conflict resolution. Um, uh, patch breaks and rule. Yep, okay. Yep, Miles, good point as well. Thank you. So here's something that we all run into every now and then. We go to update something or we go to install something, you know, require something we know exists and we get this message. Uh, nothing to install or update. And you're like, I don't think so, Composer. I know, I know there's something I can install or update. You know, why can't I install or update? Um, so my go-to whenever I see this is why not? And that's actually, a, it's actually an alias to the Composer prohibits command. But why not, I think, is just makes a whole lot more sense and a whole lot easier to remember. Um, after you do a composer update, you know, vendor name, and you get nothing to install or update, immediately, the first thing I do is composer why not vendor name. And so here's like a really simple example of that, all right? And 
Um, like if I try and composer update twig twig. Right, so obviously, you know, twig is part of Drupal core. And um, I know for a fact, like if I use um, composer outdated twig twig, this is going to outdated basically shows you that. Oh, I actually, well, let me just do a uh, composer outdated slash star. Do it this way. Um, yeah, so I'm on 2.12.5, but there's a, there's a major version update of Twig. Yay, I want that. I think, you know, I, I act like, like I do. Um, but, you know, as you saw when I did the, you know, composer update Twig, Twig. No, it's going to tell me, no, you can't have it. Nothing, you know, nothing to install or in Composer 2, the message is a little bit different. Nothing to install, update or remove. And you're like, I don't think so because I'm on version 2 and I just saw there's version 3. So, hey, Composer, why not? Twig, twig. Why can't I update twig, twig? And it, it's going to tell us. It's basically going to tell us how, well, first of all, you're using this thing, which requires, you know, something better than 141 or something better than 212. But then you're also using Drupal core, which requires something better than this. But you're also, you know, using the core recommended. This is a meta package and this requires an exact version. So here's your answer. Why not? We cannot update this because these three things are not allowing us to. So again, this is kind of a very dense or maybe not dense is not the right word, but this is a, you know, a simple example. Um, but it's incredibly useful. Composer, why not? So use that one. Um, I use depends every now and then. Um, composer depends, vendor name. And so like composer, what depends on twig? twig. So this is going to show similar information, you know, as why not. Actually, in this case, exact information. Let's try composer depends draggable views. Let's see if anything depends on draggable views. I don't think it's going to. Well, how about <laughs> how about I type faster than I talk? Um, so you know our project requires draggable views. So that's about it. All right. So that's another good tool. Um, Composer outdated, I showed you. There's a bunch of variations on Composer outdated. I actually use this um, more often than I go to the uh, um, available updates page. So, yeah. What modules are outdated? And the nice thing about this is, or what Drupal dependencies, I should say, are, are outdated. Uh, the nice thing about this is it doesn't care if the modules are enabled or not. So in this case, you know, I don't have anything um so it's a you know pretty pretty new site um you can do direct dependencies so a direct dependency is one that appears in your composer.json so something you specifically asked for as opposed to an indirect dependency which and this is a, a great demo here because i'm putting in commands that return nothing so you're welcome for that um but an indirect dependency is a dependency that gets installed um, because it's a dependency of an of another dependency here, let's try this one. Maybe I can outdate it. Minor only. New site, so I don't think we're going to get much here. But trust me, these commands all work, and they're fabulous. Um, let's see. Composer outdated minor only. Are going to get anything here? Probably not, because I just created this site on Thursday uh, for the training I did. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, these are all indirect ones. So, you know, this is all core stuff. It's like, oh, this seems important. Like, I should get this update. Right, because there looks like it's a it's a maintenance update. So let me try that. Composer, why not? You know this, and you know, guess what the answer is going to be? It's because core recommended said no. Core recommended says we're on this version, and this is what kind of keeps Drupal stable, because this is the version of Symphony HTTP kernel that passed all the tests with Drupal Core 9.0.7. So those are some really helpful commands. I showed you some of those, showed you some of their, those. All right, so when you do have a problem, whether it's, you know, Composer's not letting you do something because of a dependency conflict, start with these two. Um, then once you're, you know, if you can narrow it down to which dependencies are involved in the conflict, 
Um, one thing that works really well for me, and I say better than 50% of the time this solves the problem, is I will remove the involved dependencies and then I will re-require them together. So kind of what I was talking about earlier. So compose or remove, you know, the, 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 the problem children and then try requiring them at the same time. And this is a little bit of a typo because this should be name one right there. Man, I, that's four typos. Um, that's four demerits, my permanent record. Someone write that down. Um, but when you do it like this, let Composer figure it out. Let Composer figure out the, you know, what sub-dependency versions we need. So this works for me a lot. Um, another thing you can do um, where you're just kind of, you know, throwing up, um, throwing up your hands, um, delete the vendor directories, you know, and by the vendor directories, I also mean like your, your modules, contrib directory, anywhere where your dependencies might end up. Um, and then just compose or install reinstall the dependencies and sometimes that fixes it. Um, and I know a lot of people and someone mentioned it earlier, um, you know, deleting that compose.lock file. I, I consider that a um, like defeat, giving up. Um, I have not deleted a compose.lock file and, and done a composer install in uh, well over a year, possibly on the order of years at this point. Um, I kind of take it as a personal challenge when I get a composer dependency issue um, to, to, to figure it out. Um, and granted, I get it, you know, if you're up against a deadline or something, but at all, you know, do what you can to avoid deleting your composer lock. Because once you delete that, you're basically committed to updating everything, pretty much, unless you go in and pin stuff in your composer at JSON. But, but really, before you get to step four, really, really focus on steps one through three and see if you can't solve the problem that way. All right, how are we on time? 6.42, I have three minutes, is that is that accurate? I think it was Luke, was that your name? I'm sorry, I totally forgot. Luke, yeah, Luke is three minutes, holy cow. Okay, well, I really like this part, so maybe we'll go over, but feel free to start, you know, if, you know, if everyone needs a refreshment, feel free. Um, let's talk about this content hash file. Um, <laughs> thank you mike you know as soon as i said it i'm like someone's gonna comment on that so um let's talk about inside of the compose.lock file there is a content hash and there, oops there's a lot of stuff in there but if we just do a you know a, a real quick uh pico composer.lock you know, we can talk about this thing. It's right after, you know, four or five lines down this content hash. Let's talk about that. Um, so this, it's a value, it's calculated, it's not random, okay? It's not, you know, it, it's a calculated hash, like, like a Git hash, something like that. And it's calculated by um, the contents of the composer.json name, the require, required dev sections, the extra section, as well as some other parts. So. If you manually or, or, or if you manually change any of these sections or you compose or require something that, that ends up being a change in this, then you're gonna get a new content hash. All right, so that's thing one. It's calculated based on a bunch of stuff inside of your composer.json file. So consider the situation, you know, you add a new dependency, composer require, blah, blah, blah. You get a new content hash. Let's say you've got two Git branches. On branch one, you've added a dependency. So you get a new content hash. On branch two, you've added a different dependency. So now you have a different content hash. What happens when you go to rebase or merge branch one and branch two together? Which one of these is correct? The answer is neither. Neither, oops. Once you merge, you're basically taking the dependency from branch one and the dependency from branch two, putting them into one branch, Composer does its thing, and there's gonna be a new content hash. That's not this or not this. So you will always have a code conflict in your composer.lock when merging or rebasing divergent branches. How do you solve it? Once you kind of understand what's going on, it actually becomes a lot easier. 
So as an example, you know, I'm just going to merge in this case or, or do a, you know, talk about merging. I'm not actually going to do it. Um, if you're on branch one and you want to merge branch two into branch one, you call your git merge on you know, branch two, you're going to get your conflict, compose.lock. Every time, guaranteed, I promise. So what do you do? Well, first you just pick one. You know, you check, you, you, you want to get, you know, you can even go in there manually and get rid of all the little git conflict markers and all that stuff, but just pick one. So either pick ours or theirs. Um, in this case, since we're merging, ours is actually the version of compose.lock that's in branch one. So, so you check it out um, and then do a composer update dash dash lock. Now, this doesn't actually update any of your dependencies. All it does is update your lock file. Most importantly, it calculates a new content hash. So that's important because now you're going to get a new content hash that includes both dependencies. So that updates the lock file. So you do your git add to mark it as uh, resolved. What's the right word? It's not resolved. Uh, mark it as unconflicted, whatever the git word is, and then finish your commit. Um, works pretty much the same way when rebasing, you know, check one out, update, and then git rebase dash dash continue. So this is one again, embarrassingly probably took me three years before I really understood it. And again, it, you know, it took me just saying, you know what, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to figure out what this thing's all about and, 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 and do it. So there you go. All right, let's finish up, finish up on a, on a high note. Uh, Composer 2.0, it's faster. Um, and these numbers are, um, they are conservative, right? So tilde 50%, you know, in most cases, it's way more than 50%. Uses way much, way less memory. In some cases, it uses like 99% less memory. It's crazy how much less memory, um, which is really going to open the door for Composer 2 to be used in a lot more remote hosting environments, I think. Um, it is officially compatible with the Composer, with the Drupal Core Composer plugins, the scaffolding one and the core project message. Um, and it is compatible with many Composer plugins that are used in Drupal projects. Um, Semi-officially, Composer 1 and Composer 2 can be used on the same project at the same time. Um, and by semi-officially, um, uh, Hussein Abbas, I don't know if Hussein's here. It seems like he's always, he, I see him a lot in my Composer sections. He's kind of like my Composer wingman on my sessions and I haven't seen him. So either I've, I haven't said anything wrong yet or Hussein isn't here. Uh, but Hussein found a comment in the composer um, issue queue from one of the maintainers saying that they should be compatible. So for me, I'm calling that semi-official. Um, you can try it. It's dead simple. Dead simple to try it. Composer self-update preview. And boom, you're on the latest release candidate. You don't like it? Composer self-update dash, dash, roll back. And boom, you're on. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yep, now I'm back on 1.10. Uh, but I want to try it again. So I'm going to preview. And boom, I'm on back on 2. Dot, I think the RC2 is what's out. Yeah, RC2. So, so dead simple. Dead simple. Um, composer plugins, often by used, by used by Drupal developers. The, you know, the recommended project plugins I just mentioned, those are Composer 2 compatible. Composer patches as of a week or two ago, uh, version 1.7. So you might have to Composer update Composer patches, but that is now working with Composer 2. Yay. Um, I use this one as well, the Composer installer extenders. This lets you um, manage JavaScript -y dependencies with Composer and you, you kind of need this uh, dependency, and this is not compatible. Um, one that I use that is not yet compatible is this Composer Cleanup VCS directories. So if you are, um, if you have to commit your dependencies to your repo, this, um, this plugin will automatically delete those .git directories. Um, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of momentum towards making this Composer 2 compatible yet. I'm hoping it will just magically happen and, um, so these are the ones I see a, a lot. Uh, well, I see the Prestissimo, Hyrax slash Prestissimo Composer plugin a lot of people use. You don't need that with Composer 2. So get rid of it. 
that functionality is built into Composer 2. And there's another one. I think it's QS Traveler. I always forget what it what it is. QS Traveler, uh, uh, Composer, Drupal, something. But it's basically, it's another performance enhancement tool. For, and again, you don't need that one for Composer 2 as well. All right. By the way, here I am. This is me. Um, been doing Drupal for a long time. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any questions in the negative six minutes that we have? I don't think I missed anything in the chat. If I did, please correct me. No, you guys are super fantastic. I love it. Uh, advice for those who have to update Drupal with Aquia Lightning. I don't use Lightning, so I don't have a good answer. Uh, are you asking me, should you use Compose Painful? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't, I, I can't speak on that topic. I apologize. Yeah, I think I, I, I do. I do agree with Marky there for sure. Yeah, profiles are, you know, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of uh, install profiles, but that's just me. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for keeping me honest as well, as always. All right, well, hey, everyone, uh, you know, those of you that I, that I had a chance to talk with today at Bad Camp, I appreciate, you know, always good to see everyone. I miss, you know, I miss all my Drupal, my Drupal friends. So everyone have a great rest of your day, no matter where you are. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll see everyone around.